You are listening to Jewish History from the Inside Out, an analysis of Chazal in the context of conventional history. This Hanukkah series is dedicated in loving memory of Schneer Zalman Olav HaSholem ben Harav Menachem Mendel Sheyichia. May his memory be a blessing. Welcome back to Jewish History from the Inside Out, the Hanukkah series, Episode 2. In this episode, we discuss the history of Israel under Seleucid rule, from the time of its conquest by Antiochus III, all the way through the story of Hanukkah, as recorded in secular sources. These include the two books of Maccabees, Josephus, and an occasional tidbit from Yosephon. Now, you may be wondering why I've chosen to present the secular account first. After all, As mentioned in the previous episode, our primary source for all things Jewish, including Jewish history, is from Chazal, our sages of blessed memory. Nevertheless, I ask that you suspend judgment and trust that I have good reason for doing so. Everything will make sense in the end. As mentioned in the last episode, Antiochus III took advantage of the situation in Egypt under the child king Ptolemy V, to launch the fifth and decisive Syrian war. In the year 200 BCE, he finally wrested Judea away from the Ptolemies, who had ruled it for a full century. The Egyptian general Scopus briefly regained control in 199, but by 198 it was firmly established under Seleucid rule where it would remain until Israel finally regained its independence under the Hashmonoim, the Hasmonean dynasty. At that time, Rome had ascended the geopolitical stage as the new rising star and had begun imposing its will on the various Greek empires. And so, a few years after Antiochus conquered Judea, Rome insisted that he return it to the Ptolemies. Antiochus replied that he was in the process of working out a peace treaty with Egypt, and the Romans left him alone. To seal the truce, Antiochus wed his daughter Cleopatra to Ptolemy V, sometime around the year 194 BCE. Interestingly, according to Josephus, as part of the terms of the dowry, Antiochus and Ptolemy sheared the taxes of Samaria, Judea, and Phoenicia, although some historians doubt the veracity of this account. Either way, at this point, Judea was firmly under Seleucid rule. Antiochus III was kindly disposed towards the Jews, who had taken his side in the war against Ptolemy, and he freed them from taxes for a while. Josephus presents three letters supposedly issued by Antiochus to his subordinates in favor of the Jews. One, instructing his general Ptolemy, not to be confused with the king of Egypt, to provide animals for the sacrifices, as well as wine, flour, salt, wood, and levoino, frankincense, for the holy temple. In this letter, he also exempts the Kohanim, Levim, and the sages from taxes, as well as exempting all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem from taxes for three years. Most importantly, he exhorts his generals to allow the people to live by the laws of their ancestors. A second letter ensures that the purity of Jerusalem and the sanctity of the temple be maintained, and that anyone who transgresses these orders be fined. A third interesting letter is to General Zeuxis, recommending he take 2,000 Jewish families out of Jerusalem into Asia Minor and place them in charge of the various castles and storehouses, while Antiochus put down a rebellion in that region. Quote, I am persuaded that they will be well-disposed guardians of our possessions because of their piety towards God and because I know that my predecessors have borne witness to them that they are faithful 
but you must guarantee them that they will be able to follow their own laws. Take care of that nation as far as you are able, that no one causes them any harm. End quote. Having greatly expanded the Seleucid Empire, Antiochus adopted the title Basilius Megas, or the Great King, a title similar to that used by Alexander the Great. In the year 192 BCE, Antiochus tried invading Greece, but was ultimately defeated by the Romans. As a result of this defeat, he was required to deposit a hostage with the Romans to ensure that he would never again rebel against them. To that end, he gave them his youngest son, Mithridates, as a security. Antiochus the Great was eventually killed while on a campaign in Persia in the year 187 and was succeeded by his son, Seleucus IV. At some point, Seleucus substituted his own son, Demetrius, as a Roman hostage in place of his brother, Mithridates. The rule of Seleucus IV appears to have been uneventful for the Jews, but for a single incident recorded in the second book of Maccabees. It's a fascinating tale that ends in a resounding victory for the Jews, but also foreshadows the treachery and infighting that was to mark the following decades. In this account, a certain Shimon enters into an altercation with the high priest, the Kohen Godel, Yochanan, over some commercial matters. A short digression is in order. The name Yochanan, in its many forms, Chanyoy, Chananyo, or Yochanan, was the most popular name among the high priests, the Kehanim Gedoilim. We know of no less than five, and possibly up to seven or eight, Kehanim Gedoilim who carried that name. Which Yochanan are we speaking of? According to Josephus, when Yochanan, the son of Shimon HaTzadik, passed away, he left a son Shimon, who was Kohen Gadol for a short time, probably around three years or so. When Shimon passed away, he left two or three children, including a Yochanan, how not, and Yehoshua. According to most scholars, it is this new Yochanan we are speaking of, great-grandson of Shimon HaTzadik. Now back to our story. Following an amended version of Maccabees 2, Shimon is a Kohen from the family of Bilga, a priestly family known for its treachery during the time of the Shemad, that period of spiritual annihilation that preceded the Hanukkah miracle. At any rate, Shimon informs one of Seleucus's governors that there is a great treasure stored in the temple in Jerusalem, the Beis Hamikdash, that Seleucus might be interested in obtaining. The governor transmits the information to Seleucus, who sends one of his underlings, a man by the name of Heliodorus, to confiscate the treasure. Heliodorus arrives in Jerusalem and inquires about the treasure. Yochanan informs him that the money he is guarding was deposited to him mostly by widows and orphans, and it would be a crime to betray their trust. Heliodorus disregards the Kohen Gadol's words and arrives at the temple on the appointed day to seize the treasure. The book of Maccabees describes in great detail the somber mood of the populace and the grave appearance of the Kohen Gadol. The entire city is calling out to Hashem in prayer and waiting in trepidation as Heliodorus makes his way to the temple. As he and his guards are about to enter the temple treasury, they are struck by an awesome vision. A knight in golden armor upon a mighty steed suddenly appears and charges at Heliodorus, striking him with his two forelegs. The knight is then joined by two mighty young men in shining garments on either side who beat Heliodorus again and again. Heliodorus falls to the ground in a faint and is carried away by his men. They plead with Yochanan to pray to God that his life be speared. Yochanan offers a sacrifice on behalf of Heliodorus, and the two young men in shining garments once again appear and inform him that he would be speared in the merit of the high priest. He regains his strength 
and offers a sacrifice, thanking Hashem for allowing him to live. The final lines of this account read as follows, quote, Upon his return, Heliodorus was asked by the king whom it would be appropriate to send to Jerusalem in his stead, to which he replied, If you have an enemy, some traitor who aspires to the throne, send him there, and he will suffer greatly, if indeed he manages to remain alive. Still, Shimon persists in his schemes and tries to incite the people against Yochanan. Things eventually reach fever pitch when one of Shimon's men commits an act of murder. At that point, Yochanan flees to Antioch to plead his case before the king. The events at this point are a bit murky. It appears that Yochanan did not get a chance to speak with King Seleucus before Seleucus was murdered shortly after Yochanan's arrival. Ironically, Seleucus's murder is attributed to Heliodorus, who apparently himself aspired to the throne. Seleucus's death occurred in the year 175 BCE, after about a decade of rule. Mithridates was living in Athens when his brother was assassinated, but he immediately traveled to Antioch and seized the throne. It was then that he assumed the name Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. He was Antiochus IV, but he may as well have been Antiochus Oive. Shortly after Antiochus' ascent to the throne, with Yochanan still in Syria, Yehoshua, Yochanan's younger brother, appeared before the king and asked to be appointed Kohen Gadol in his place. Yehoshua was a Hellenist who changed his name to Jason, and he promised the king 440 talents, a ridiculous sum of money, to acquire that post plus an additional 150 talents if he were granted permission to erect a gymnasium and an arena in Jerusalem. Antiochus readily agreed. Maccabees too describes the sad scene as the young Koyanim would leave the temple in middle of their service to participate in the games and wrestling matches. When Antiochus arrived in Judea in the year 172, he was welcomed by Jason and his cronies with torches and great fanfare. At that point, the Beis Hamikdash was still functional, somewhat. At least they were still offering sacrifices to Hashem and not to some pagan deity. After three years as high priest, Jason sent an emissary to Antiochus to pay up the money he had promised him three years earlier. The emissary was a man by the name of Menelaus, a friend of the Tobiads. According to Maccabees II, Menelaus was the brother of Shimon, who had quarreled with Yochanan Koyin Gadol some years earlier during the reign of Seleucus. Menelaus arrived in Antioch and promptly offered Antiochus an additional 300 talents, if only he would be appointed Koyin Gadol. Antiochus was more than happy to acquiesce. According to Josephus, it was Menelaus who built the gymnasium in Jerusalem and not Jason. However, Josephus' version seems highly suspect, so we will trust the book of Maccabees on this one. Menelaus had a hard time coming up with the money, and he was soon summoned by the king to Antioch. However, at that time, a revolt broke out in one of the king's provinces, and he left Syria to deal with the issue leaving his minister Andronicus in charge. Menelaus took advantage of the king's absence and bribed Andronicus with vessels he had stolen from the temple. Yochanan, the old Kohen Godel, who had in the meantime taken refuge in a suburb of Antioch, rebuked Menelaus for his wickedness. Menelaus decided to do away with Yochanan once and for all. He lured him out of his place of refuge under false pretenses and then incited Andronicus to kill him. While Menelaus was in Antioch, the Jews sent three elders to plead with Antiochus against Menelaus. Through flattery and treachery, Menelaus prevailed, and instead of removing him from his post, Antiochus had the three elders killed. At that time, around the year 170 BCE, Antiochus declared war on Egypt. 
The Ptolemies had been demanding the return of Judea for a number of years, and Antiochus decided to launch a preemptive attack, which was very successful. He routed the Egyptian army, captured all of Egypt but for Alexandria, and took Ptolemy VI captive. He then allowed Ptolemy to continue to rule in name only, in order to avoid angering the Romans, who held a powerful influence over all geopolitical affairs. While in Egypt, rumor got out that Antiochus had been killed. Jason, the Koyin Godel who was ousted by Menelaus, determined this was his chance to regain his post. He assembled a small army of a thousand men and took the city by force, deposing Menelaus, who fled the city of Jerusalem. Once inside, Jason killed anyone who had opposed him. But his victory was short-lived, for Antiochus was alive after all. And when the news of Jason's revolt reached him in Egypt, he returned to Israel and marched on Jerusalem. Once inside, he killed its inhabitants, men, women, and children. In three days, 40,000 men, women, and children were brutally slaughtered by Antiochus' army and an equal number were taken captive. Antiochus plundered the temple treasury, stealing 1,800 talents of silver, along with a number of vessels from the temple, and Menelaus was restored as high priest. Antiochus left two governors to enforce his rule. Philip of Phrygia, described as, quote, crueler than his master, to rule over Jerusalem, and Andronicus over the Samaritans on Mount Gerizim. But worse than them all was the arrogant Menelaus, who was an enemy to his own people. Two years passed in this precarious state. Menelaus ran the temple. The Hellenists grew in strength and influence, and the overall situation continued to deteriorate. In the year 168, Antiochus attacked Egypt for the second time. This time, the Romans intervened. According to the Greek historian Polybius, the Roman ambassador ordered Antiochus to withdraw from Egypt or he would be in direct conflict with Rome. When Antiochus asked for time to consider, the ambassador drew a line in the sand around Antiochus and said, Before you leave this circle, you will give me an answer that I can take back to the Roman Senate. Meaning that if he left the circle without giving his word to abandon Egypt immediately, it would be considered a declaration of war against Rome. Thus humiliated, Antiochus agreed to withdraw. Upon his return home through Judea, he unleashed all of his pent-up wrath and frustration on the Jews. According to Josephus, Antiochus himself arrived in Jerusalem a second time and was welcomed there by the Hellenists. However, according to both books of Maccabees, which seem more reliable, he sent his general Apollonius in his place. Apollonius arrived at the holy city with an army of 22,000 men. Pretending peace, he camped outside until Shabbos, and then, when he knew the Jews would be resting, he launched a surprise attack and took the city. He killed many of the men and took 10,000 women and children into captivity. He then entered the holy temple and removed the menorah, the shulchan, the incense altar, and the curtains that hung over the entryways of the temple. He destroyed the city walls and erected a fortress called the Akra, or Chakra, overshadowing the holy temple. In it, he placed the garrison of Greek soldiers. Many of the Hellenists took up residence in the Acre, from where they would terrorize the faithful populace. Now Antiochus issued decrees forbidding the practice of Torah and mitzvahs, in particular the mitzvahs of Shabbos, Yom Tiv, and Bris Mila. Torah scrolls were burned. The temple was desecrated. Pigs were sacrificed on the altar and Jews forced to eat from their flesh. According to both books of Maccabees, the desecration took place on the 25th of Kislev in the year 3594, 167 BCE. 
An idol was placed on the altar and the temple dedicated to a Greek pagan god, and all sorts of pagan rites and acts of immorality filled its holy halls. Thus began the period known as the Shmad, spiritual annihilation. This anti-religious campaign was led by an Athenian elder, possibly named Philip, who may or may not have been a childhood friend of Antiochus and may or may not be identical with Philip of Phrygia, governor of Jerusalem. Anyone caught circumcising their children suffered a cruel death. Anyone found keeping Shabbos was brutally murdered. Many Jews fled to the desert in order to be able to practice Judaism. In one specific and famous incident, a thousand Jews, men, women, and children, were discovered in a cave on Shabbos and were suffocated to death, ostensibly because they refused to fight on Shabbos. We will return to this story in the course of our discussion. Two women caught circumcising their sons, were hanged with their infants around their necks. Elazar, one of the great sages, was commanded to eat swine's flesh, which he refused to do. Some of the Hellenists offered to give him kosher meat so that it would only seem like he was eating pig, but he rebuffed them and was tortured to death. According to Maccabees II, this is when the story of a woman known variously as Chana or Miriam and her seven sons, gave up their lives to sanctify Hashem's name rather than bow to the idol of Antiochus. This account is perhaps the most multiversioned aspect of the Hanukkah story. It appears in different forms in Medrash and Gemara, as well as in Lahavdil, the second book of Maccabees, in a minor apocryphal work known as the fourth book of Maccabees, and in Yosefu. At first, the Greeks also persecuted the Samaritans, assuming that they were just another Jewish sect. The Samaritans immediately detached themselves from the Jews and declared in a letter to Antiochus that they were not Jews at all, but rather Phoenicians, and that they would gladly dedicate their temple to the Greek gods. Antiochus promptly ceased his persecution of them and enshrined their temple under the name of some other pagan deity. In addition, Antiochus ordered troops to go to the various towns and villages and erect altars and sacrifice pigs to their pagan gods. Then they would force the Jews to eat from its flesh. One such group, led by an officer by the name of Apelles, arrived at the town of Moedin. There they erected an altar and gathered the townspeople for the sacrificial ceremony. The town elder was a man by the name of Matis Yohu, who had five sons, Yochanan, Shimon, Yehuda, Elazar, and Yoinasan. Apelles demanded Matis Yohu lead the ceremony and slaughter the pig, to which Matis Yohu replied, Even if every nation on earth were to desert the customs of his ancestors and heed the king's command, my sons, my brothers, and I will keep the covenant of our fathers. We will never stray from Hashem's Torah and His commandments. At these words, another Jew stepped forward to sacrifice at the altar. Matis Yohu was filled with rage, and he charged at the Jew and slew him on the spot. Yisifun provides a rather graphic account in which Matis Yohu severs the traitor's head and raises it up to the sky, then casts it at the feet of Apelles. The traitor's body collapses on the altar, where it is burned along with the pig's flesh. Matis Yohu then killed Apelles along with a number of his men. Knowing that the Greeks would not be long to retaliate, he called out to the townspeople, Anyone who is zealous for Hashem's sake, follow me, and fled to the hills with his sons and their families, leaving everything he owned behind. In the battle accounts that follow, we will be making use of an excellent book on various aspects of ancient Jewish warfare titled Battles of the Bible by Chaim Herzog and Mordechai Gichon. In it, the authors speculate regarding the precise locations of various military clashes based on their knowledge of Israeli topography and military strategy. Word of the revolt got out 
and the remaining faithful escaped to the hills and joined Matisyahu and his men. It is assumed that they were headquartered in the hills of Goifno, northeast of Medin, in the Samaria region due north of Jerusalem. The mountainous area was easier for the rebels to defend and more difficult for the large and cumbersome Greek armies to traverse. Over the next year, Matisyahu and his sons made a name for themselves, launching nightly raids against Greek units, routing them and confiscating their weapons. Any town they entered, they smashed the pagan altars and destroyed the Hellenists. Many Hellenists fled to the Greeks for protection. After about a year leading the revolt, in the year 166 BCE, Matisyahu passed away and was buried in Moedin. Before he died, he assembled all of his followers and encouraged them to continue fighting for Hashem and his Torah. He passed the mantle of leadership to Yehuda, appointing him commander-in-chief of the war effort. Shortly after the death of Matisyahu, in the second year of the revolt, the Jews were to face their first battle against an organized army. Apollonius, governor of Samaria, and commander of Antiochus' troops in the region, led a large force of several thousand soldiers against Yehuda and his several hundred men. Tellingly, Apollonius's army also contained a number of Samaritans, those sworn enemies of the Jews who had written off any connection to the Jewish people. Now, the Seleucids were accustomed to doing battle in a military formation known as a phalanx. A phalanx is a battle formation composed of a number of soldier units, each unit made up of soldiers fighting shoulder to shoulder and several rows deep. The front row of soldiers would lock shields with each other, while the second row stuck out their spears in the spaces between the soldiers of the first row. If the first row fell, the second row would take up their shields, and the third row would stick out their spears, and so on and so forth. The entire force would charge the enemy like a massive lawnmower, protected by shields and armor up front, spears protruding like teeth to devour the enemy. The size of the phalanx units varied over time. At the time of the Hanukkah story, the units in use were made up of rows of 16 men across and 16 rows deep, for a total of 256 soldiers per unit. Each such unit was called a syntagma. For syntagma, created a kiliarchia, containing 1,024 men. And two kiliarchiae comprised the smallest phalanx in use at that time. The advantage of the phalanx was in its force and momentum. It was a massive, unstoppable human war machine. Its weakness lied in its lack of maneuverability. Once the phalanx was committed to a particular point of attack, it would be very difficult to pivot should the ground circumstances change. Traditionally, battles were fought in the open plain, with both armies clashing head-to-head in a large flat area. Fighting under such terms would naturally spell immediate defeat for Yehuda and his small band of rebels, and he chose instead to ambush the enemy on their southern march through the Goifna hills. Scholars assume Yehuda waited until the enemy entered a narrow pass, forcing it to slim down the width of its ranks, and then he launched a surprise attack. According to Yosifun, Yehuda spotted Apollonius in the middle of his troops and made a beeline for him, killing him on the spot. Their leader dead, the Greeks turned and began to flee. For all of its superior weaponry and fighting experience, the Greek army was thoroughly trounced and all of its weapons fell into Yehuda's hands. According to one account, Yehuda took the sword of Apollonius and fought with it all his life. When Antiochus heard of Apollonius' defeat, he realized he had a problem on his hands. The size of the problem, however, was not immediately clear to him. And so, without analyzing the situation, he dispatched Seren, governor of southern Syria and Lebanon, to put down the rebellion. 
Seren considered this mission an easy way to advance his career, and he assembled a large army, which included a sizable number of Jewish Hellenists. Rather than stumble into the same trap as Apollonius, he circumnavigated the Goifna Hills entirely, taking the broad and open coastal road instead, along the Mediterranean Sea. Seren's army was probably double that of Apollonius, and although Yehuda's force had grown in the interim, they were vastly outnumbered and outarmed. It is estimated that Yehuda's army numbered around 1,000 or so mostly inexperienced fighters, while Seren's contained around 5,000 battle-trained soldiers with the latest weaponry. When he arrived at the general area of present-day Tel Aviv Yafo, he turned eastward toward Jerusalem, choosing the secondary route, that is, the northern of the two east-west roads which lead to Jerusalem. Incidentally, this was also the route chosen by Israeli forces to advance on Jerusalem during the Six-Day War. Yehuda led his forces southward out of the Gophna Hills and westward towards the approaching army. When the Jews, who had not eaten all day, beheld the size of the Greek army, their spirits sank. How could such a small number of soldiers fight such an army? But Yehuda encouraged his men. Hashem can make us victorious regardless of our number. They advance upon us with arrogance and treachery, but we are fighting for our lives and our religion. Have no fear. Hashem will deliver them into our hands. He decided to reprieve the same tactic that had worked for him the first time. As the dawn broke and the Greek army began making its way through the pass of Beis Choyrein, flanked on either side by steep slopes, Yehuda led an ambush and attacked the enemy on its ascent. He instructed his men to ignore all else and reach Sered. At the sound of the first battle cry, the Greek army was sent into disarray. Yehuda and his men charged Seren and slew him. Their commander dead, the troops began to flee towards the coastal plain. Yehuda and his men killed some 800 troops, while the rest of the army disintegrated. Finally, the penny dropped, and Antiochus got the memo that something was terribly amiss in Judea. He flew into a terrible rage and resolved that he would not be embarrassed a third time. Antiochus planned to penetrate into the territory of Judea in the spring of the year 165 BCE. He gathered his entire army and paid them in advance. In addition, he hired foreign mercenaries from the neighboring countries. However, seeing that his treasury was depleted, he decided to replenish his coffers by collecting tribute from the Persians who had rebelled against him. And so he took half the army with him to fight the Persians in the east and left as a regent his viceroy Lysias to look after his son Eupater and manage the war against Judea. He commanded him to, quote, uproot and annihilate the strength of Israel and the remnant of Jerusalem, to take its inhabitants captive and settle foreigners in their place. To accomplish this goal, Lysias sent three generals, Ptolemy, Nicanor, and Gorgias, with a huge army of 40,000 foot soldiers and 7,000 horsemen, against Yehuda and his men. According to some sources, the campaign was initiated by Philip, the governor of Jerusalem, and was led by Nicanor. By that time, Yehuda had amassed a force of around 6,000 soldiers, but they were outnumbered approximately 8 to 1. So certain were the Seleucids of their victory that they invited many slave dealers to join them on their campaign, offering them Jewish slaves in advance of the war at the discounted price of 90 slaves to the talent. They brought along lots of chains in anticipation of what they thought was sure to be a total destruction of the Jewish force. The army also attracted many camp followers from Gaza and Edumia the land of Edoin. It appeared that Yehuda and his men did not stand a chance. This time, 
the Greeks took the main, southern road to Jerusalem and set up camp in the city of Emmaus, southwest of Moedin. Again, Yehuda led his forces southward toward Jerusalem, pausing at Mitzpeh Gilod. Mitzpeh had served the Jews in the past as a place of prayer under the prophet Shmuel. Yehuda declared a day of fasting, and the people rent their garments, put on sackcloth, and placed ashes on their heads. They read from the Torah and brought forth the priestly garments, as well as the Bikurim and Meiser Shani fruits, since it was around the time of Shavuos, and assembled the Nazirim who had completed their terms. What will become of all of these? they cried out to heaven. Your temple is in ruins, your priests are in mourning. The nations have gathered to destroy us. You are our only salvation. Yehuda organized the army into companies, platoons, and units, and divided them into four battalions of 1,500 men each, one of which was led by him, and the other three under the command of his brothers Yoichanon, Yoinason, and Shimon. Elazar was appointed as the Koyen Mashuach Milchama, the priest anointed to address and encourage the troops before battle. This time, Yehuda had to dispense with the element of surprise, for there was no way he could ambush so large an army on such a broad and open plain. Yehuda led the rebel army to the hills directly southeast of Emmaus, and the two camps were now clearly in sight of each other. Nicanor decided to imitate Yehuda's tactics and he sent Gorgias in the dark of night with 5,000 men and 100 cavalry to surprise attack the Jewish base camp. Yehuda was informed of the enemy's plan, and he lit a large number of bonfires to indicate the presence of a large army. Then he withdrew the army, leaving behind a small force at the edge of the camp. When Gorgias arrived at the camp, he found it empty. Noticing some soldiers in the distance, he imagined that Yehuda and his men had fled to the hills and that what he had just glimpsed was the rear guard retreating, and he decided to pursue them into the mountains. Gorgias and his men were thus left pursuing a phantom force in the hills, while Yehuda and his men advanced upon the Greek base. He divided his army into two, taking two battalions with him and leaving the other two as reserves to assist as necessary. At dawn, Yehuda and his force appeared at the enemy camp, ill-equipped, outnumbered, and facing an enormous Greek army, half of which was arrayed in a battle formation, the other half resting, confident that they were well protected. They believed the Jewish army was being harassed by Gorgias, and besides, they were protected by the powerful phalanxes out in front. Yehuda blew the shoifer and led the charge towards the Greek phalanx. Herzog and Gichon conjecture that he probably attacked from one of the flanks rather than head on, insinuating his soldiers throughout the Greek ranks. The Greek army was completely discombobulated and began to fracture. The rest of the Jewish army then attacked the Greek reserves, who were taken completely by surprise and were utterly crushed. Yehuda warned the people not to get distracted by the spoils of war, for they still had Gorgias to contend with. Then he set fire to the enemy camp. Out in the hills, Gorgias and his men suddenly found themselves steering at their base camp going up in flames. Retracing their steps, they smacked straight into Yehuda's men. So shaken were they by the sudden turn of events that they fled without a fight to Gaza in the southwest. Only then did Yehuda plunder the enemy camp, taking large sums of money, praising and singing to Hashem all the while. The battle was fought on a Friday, and they welcomed the Shabbos with song and praise. In total, 9,000 Greek troops were killed, and the army was shattered. According to one account, Nicanor just barely escaped with his life by disguising himself as a beggar and fleeing by foot until he made his way back to Antioch in disgrace. <laughs>
Yehuda would face one more battle before he could enter Jerusalem and cleanse the Holy Temple. At this point, the accounts in Maccabees 1 and 2 diverge. Maccabees 2 tells of a war against Timotheus and an accomplice known as Bacchides. It does not provide much detail except to say that some 20,000 enemy soldiers were killed. Maccabees 1, on the other hand, recounts a war with the viceroy Lysias. Each of these, Lysias and Timotheus, fought the Maccabees more than once. According to Maccabees 1, one battle against Lysias occurred before the restoration of the temple, and both battles against Timotheus after. Maccabees 2 has it the other way around. One battle against Timotheus before, and both battles against Lysias after. The conflicting accounts may be the result of the multiple wars fought against each. Though far from certain that it is the correct account, most scholars accept the chronology presented in Maccabees 1. At any rate, that is the one we will follow. I'll provide details from the corresponding account in Maccabees 2 regarding the first war against Lysias under the assumption that it is discussing the same event. When Lysias heard of the Seleucid army's defeat, he wasted no time in mounting a new assault. He marched into Israel with 60,000 troops and 5,000 cavalry, the largest army the Maccabees had ever faced. In Maccabees 2, the number is even higher, 80,000 troops, all of his cavalry, and 80 elephants. Rather than approach from the north, as Apollonius had done, or from the west, like Seren and the trio of generals at Emmaus, Lysias decided to use the most secure route, taking the coastal road as far south as Ashkelon, before turning eastward towards Maresha and Hevron. This was friendly territory for the Greeks, inhabited as it was by the Idumeans, the Edoimim, enemies of the Jews. From there, he turned northward, moving on Jerusalem from the south. Yehuda was obviously well appraised of Lysias' movements, and he led his army of 10,000 men southward to meet the Greek army at Beist Sur. Beist Sur was a fortified town about six miles north of Hebron. Lysias had laid siege to the fortress and was choking its inhabitants. The Maccabee army prayed to Hashem for a miracle, and the miracle was not long in coming. On their march past Jerusalem, Yehuda's men beheld an awesome sight, a horse rider in white, bearing golden armor. At this angelic vision, the entire army was invigorated with strength, and they pounced upon the enemy, killing thousands of them. According to Maccabees 1, 5,000 foot soldiers were slain. According to Maccabees 2, the number was about double that, 11,000 foot soldiers and 1,600 horsemen. When Lysias realized that the Jews were ready to fight to the death and that God was on their side, he decided to retreat, call a truce, and live to fight another day. The account in Maccabees 2 contains a correspondence between the Jews, Lysias, Antiochus, and the Roman Senate, in which the Jews are guaranteed freedom to practice their religion and are, quote, forgiven for their unwitting rebellion against the empire. Recall, though, that as mentioned earlier, Maccabees 2 has this battle occurring under Antiochus V, Eupater, the young son of Antiochus IV. Some speculate that there may have been more to Lysias' hasty retreat. All this time, Antiochus had been fighting the Persians to the east. After some initial success, he was driven away from the city of Persepolis by the local populace. He was still in Persia in the year 164 BCE when the news reached him of Lysias' defeat. He flew into a rage and commanded his riders to spur their horses without rest so that he can reach Israel and vent his anger and humiliation on the Jews. But his fate had already been sealed. At some point along his journey he fell ill, with a terrible and deathly illness. Excruciating stomach pains assailed him. 
Still, he drove his horsemen ever faster, until it happened at some point that he was hurled out of his chariot and all of his limbs were crushed. Thus broken, he was carried away by his men. A terrible stench emanated from his body, and worms began eating away at his flesh. According to both books of Maccabees, before his death, he acknowledged that his suffering was divine retribution for all of his cruelty and his evil ways. On his deathbed, he entrusted Philip, his childhood friend, with the education of his son, Antiochus Eupater. Then he died. His pride shattered, his empire frayed, far away from home in a strange and foreign land. This, scholars contend, is what prompted Lysias' speedy return to Antioch. Wary of Philip, he wanted to ensure that he retained full control of the young Antiochus and of the Seleucid Empire. With the Seleucid army now expelled from the land, Yehuda finally set his sights on the holy city of Jerusalem and its holy temple. He gathered his men, and they made their way to the Temple Mount. The terrible sight of destruction and desecration that met their eyes was too much for them to bear, and they tore their garments, burst out in tears, and placed ashes on their heads. They fell down on their faces and cried out to God in heaven. Yehuda directed a company of soldiers to engage the remaining Greeks and Hellenists in the Acre fortress, while he and his fellow Koyanim set about restoring the temple. They removed all of the impurities from the temple, destroyed the old altar that had been desecrated, and built a new one in its place. They fashioned new vessels, a new menorah, shulchan, an incense altar. They offered holy sacrifices on the altar and lit the menorah. They placed the bread on the shulchan and hung the curtains over the entryways. But wait, what about the miracle of the oil and the eight days of Hanukkah? Well, let me quote from the books of Maccabees and Josephus. Maccabees 1, quote, The cleansing of the temple was finally concluded. They arose on the 25th day of the month of Kislev, exactly three years to the day from when the temple was first desecrated, and offered a carbon toida, a thanksgiving offering to Hashem, with song and praise, harps and cymbals. They prostrated themselves before God and gave thanks to heaven who had made them victorious. And they celebrated the dedication of the altar for eight days, offering numerous sacrifices upon it. Yehuda and his brothers in the entire Jewish congregation declared these eight days an annual holiday commemorating the rededication of the altar every year beginning on the 25th day of Kislev. Maccabees 2 Quote, And on the 25th day of Kislev, the day in which the temple had been defiled by the Gentiles, on that same day it was purified. They celebrated for eight days, recalling the fact that but a short time earlier they had spent the holiday of Sukkot, roaming mountains and caves like wild animals. And so they took myrtle leaves and palm branches and esteric fruits and offered thanks to he who had blessed their efforts to purify his sanctuary. With the consent of the congregation, they established an annual holiday for the Jewish nation to be celebrated every year on this date. And finally, Josephus, quote, The Jews were so overjoyed that they were allowed once again to keep their laws and serve their God, that they declared a holiday for all posterity to commemorate the rededication of the temple service for eight days. And from that time until today, we celebrate this holiday, known as the Festival of Lights. I suppose it is called thus because our liberty was suddenly granted to us after we had given up and lost all hope. End quote. Wait, what? As you have surely noticed, conspicuously absent from all of these accounts is any mention of the miracle of the oil. What happened to the single cruise of pure olive oil with the insignia of the Kohen Gadol? What happened to the menorah that burned for eight days and nights? What kind of a Hanukkah celebration is it without the mitzvah of lighting the menorah? What's worse, 
you surely realize that without the oil, Hanukkah is bereft of its latkes and donuts as well. This concludes the conventional historical account of Hanukkah. The absence of any mention of the miracle of the oil leaves a gaping hole in the secular version of the Hanukkah story as we know it. After all, the miracle of the oil is the most central aspect of the entire holiday of Hanukkah. Fear not, my friends, it'll all come together in the end. Stay tuned for the next episode as we present Chazal's version of the story of Hanukkah.